wonderful to be here from the US. Um, I'm going to kind of change it up a little bit um, as far as kind of scale <laughs> is concerned, maybe. Um, we are based in New York City. Um, the Center for Actual Design was actually born out of a program that was started during the Bloomberg administration. Um, and the whole idea behind active design, and I know some of you have studied active design, but the whole idea of active design was that we can take health research and data and we can translate it into practical design strategies to be used at all scales of our built environment. So to inform how we design our infrastructure, our public spaces, our public buildings, our private buildings, using an evidence base where the buildings are really optimized, the spaces are optimized for people. So very appropriate <laughs> continuation of what Jack was talking about, that, that space is for people, cities are for people. They are not for cars. Cars are for moving people. Um, so this was very much our priority and is our priority. What is optimized for people? Um, so we continue to work in New York City, but at this point we actually work globally. Um, and I'm just going to kind of show you a little bit about what started the Center Factory Design because it's very relevant in this current environment of you know, COVID-19. So we believed that as building professionals in New York City, we had a role to play in the health outcomes of the community and of the city. Um, but many people didn't believe us. Many people didn't believe that the places that you live and you work were actually having a measurable impact on your health and your health outcomes. And this is 10 years ago. So this is not very long ago that we, even with Michael Bloomberg as our spokesperson, um, would be jumping up and down trying to get people's attention that we actually have a role to play in, um, in affecting health, physical health, mental health, etc. So we actually looked back to the precedent of more than 100 years ago in New York City and how New York had actually leveraged its built environment in order to really mitigate the spread of infectious disease. So now you can see why this is very relevant. So New York City, the, the majority of the population of New York was die of, dying of infectious disease back in the 1800s. And New York's response to this was really to look at its public spaces and its public realm and policy um, and create the park system, including Central Park, was specifically created to mitigate um, actually uh, airborne diseases. It was described as the working man's, man's lung at the time in the newspapers. Um, we created, they created, New York City created policies uh, that set minimum standards for light and air for housing in the Tenement House Act. Uh, zoning ordinances, New York City had the first zoning ordinance that really looked at how do you start to separate uses of buildings in order to exacerbate uh, poor air quality, um, noise, all of the kind of the things that come along with industry. Um, so all of these things were done in the name of health. And so this gave us um, confidence that we could once again address today's health outcomes and health crisis using our built environment and using this very holistic approach to uh, looking at our infrastructure and looking at all of these levers. So the percentage of infectious disease in 1800 was 57%. New York City had brought that down to 11% by 1940. Um, which is before the widespread use of antibiotics. So very successful in affecting infectious disease. And we really set off with active design to see if we could start to mitigate um, some of the risk factors behind chronic disease. So the three Lord leading causes of preventable death globally um, are physical inactivity, smoking, and the third one to join that just recently is actually social isolation. Again, very relevant at the moment. So mental health is now up there with smoking and uh, physical inactivity as a leading cause of preventable death globally. Each one accounts for about 5 million premature deaths a year. Um, and you can see that certainly in New York, it is chronic disease that is currently the leading cause of death um, by far. So this is something that you know, we wanted to mitigate. So why did we, just, why did we concentrate on design? Um, even 10 years ago, the research base coming from academic institutions around the world was really pointing to the fact that design had a big impact on behavior, especially around physical activity, which was the first area that active design really looked at. Um, and we can see from the evidence base that your physical environment is actually gonna uh, determine how much you walk down the street, uh, how, much you, how much time you spend in the play space. So this is actually a, a play area in a public school in New York City. Um, this is pretty typical, where they just repurpose the parking lot for the children to play um, without a massive investment in, um, in infrastructure. This is how the, the parking lot was then changed. 
this is basically just using uh, uh, pa paving paint and relatively inexpensive um, infrastructure improvements has a really massive impact on the amount of time people spend in the space, uh, the kind of play that children engage in, um, the amount of imaginative play, cognitive function, physical activity, um, all of these things are impacted by these very elementary design changes to this space. Um, we also change policy and allow the community to use the spaces outside of the typical school day because public space is at a premium in New York City and many communities do not have parks within a walkable uh, distance uh, to where they live. And we know again from the research that you are only going to consider a public space as your public space if it's within a 10 minute walk of where you live. Um, so very important that everybody has access and again today we're just once again kind of the disparities in our public spaces um, are mir mirrored by, by all of the health disparities that we see um, in New York but elsewhere also. So this is why we focus on design It's also because we're designers <laughs> and so that's what we do so that's always helpful. Um, my background is actually in real estate development so if we'd like to have a discussion about uh, real estate that would be good too. Um, the other th reason that we, the Center for Actual Design, really look at space is because of that disparity and the fact that we can really leverage public space as a tool for fostering equity. So equitable access to well-designed, well-maintained public space has impacts on all aspects of health outcomes. And you can see here that actually well-designed public space can start to level the playing field even when it comes to economic disparities. Uh, so I won't read this, but all of these are citations from peer-reviewed research, and we can share all of those afterwards. Um, high quality, I keep using the word high quality because all outdoor space is not equal, and it is essential that it is um, well, it is designed in order to meet the priorities of the population that it's serving. Um, so there's not a one-size-fits-all design solution here. That is the role of designers to go out and actually understand the needs of the population, the history, of the space, the geography, the climate, you know, all design is local, <laughs> all solutions should be specific to the place. Um, so high quality design, it has a lot of different aspects in it. Um, maintenance is also something I'm gonna talk about a lot. But you can see here that high quality design, neighborhood green spaces are associated with really addressing mental health. And I am gonna kind of repeatedly mention mental health. I think physical health, we've been talking about for a long time with active design. There's no doubt that it impacts physical activity levels. Um, I think mental health is something that is less well understood by the design community. And so it's something that we want to focus on and um, raising awareness. The design solutions are often the same as the design solutions for increasing physical activity, but it's important to understand that you are absolutely impacting mental health outcomes also. So you can see here that um, green space is associated with lower rates of depression, anxiety, and stress. Um, so not bad for a few trees. Um, the way that we share our practice, um, we share in multiple different ways and I'm going to give you some um, links so that you can download these, these uh, uh, publications. So the Active Design Guidelines were published 10 years ago now in, in New York City. Shocking that it's 10 years, but there we are. Um, so that's obviously all of this is available. You can download all of these on our website for free. These are all publications. So each of the first three are really taking the evidence base and translating it for different audiences and looking at different aspects of how our public realm, how our public spaces impact our overall health. Um, so the first act of design is looking at physical activity. The next one, building healthy places, is really looking at the role that real estate developers play <laughs> in affecting our um, health outcomes using the private sector. Um, and then the next assembly is the one we're going to talk about more today. This is our most recent major publication, and it really pushed public health and the research in public health into what we call civic design. So looking at how does the role of design of space and the maintenance of space, uh, how does that affect uh, civil, civic outcomes? Um, and we define that as trust, participation in public life, stewardship of the public realm, so what is it about the design cues in your space that actually means that you'll drop litter or that you'll pick it up? Does design play a role in that kind of behavior? The answer is yes, it does. Um, but actually there wasn't a lot of research on that. So we uh, gathered all the research that exists globally and then we actually engaged um, researchers in UC Berkeley uh, in California to do some original research, uh, national research, but original research looking at the role of design um, in that kind of behavior. And lastly is Fitwell. Fitwell is a 
building and site certification that we operate that was actually created by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the US federal government, and then we were selected to operate FitWell. And the reason FitWell is, is important in this discussion is it, it has allowed us to create a standard that is applicable across all spaces, all buildings, um, and it's applicable globally. Um, and we've really been able to expand um, the reach and our ability to share this knowledge with a far larger audience through FitWell. So assembly, I'm gonna just show how these two things go together. Assembly is really looking to build on the public health research. So this is really to go alongside all of that public health research. This is, this is pushing the boundaries. Some of this is very much at the forefront of research. Um, some of it doesn't have a body of research behind it. Maybe just our research is the only research in this area. Um, so this is kind of pushing, pushing the bounds of what we understand, the role that public space and design plays uh, in our overall quality of life and civic life. Um, some of the kind of additional information that we learned um, that was outside of our public health research knowledge was really the role that arts and programming play in community and in community spaces. Um, it really does change the perception of the community. Um, we did a lot of very pretty diagrams, but it actually increases uh, the trust within a community if they are participating in those arts um, and cultural programming within their public spaces. It increases participation, perhaps not surprisingly, but it also increases stewardship. People begin to own the spaces and feel responsible for their public spaces and feel that they are for them, which is a very important um, aspect of kind of how we perceive the spaces that we live in. Is it for me or is it for somebody else? Um, very important that people see this as their public space. And kind of what we were talking about, who, who does the public space belong to? Um, the next piece is maintenance. So active design had never really looked at maintenance before, but what we found very quickly from the folks that we were working with on assembly, as well as from the research, that maintenance is essential in public space for public space to have a positive contribution to the community. Um, it doesn't actually matter how much green space you have, if it's poorly maintained, it's going to have a negative impact on people's trust and perception uh, of whether they are cared for, whether they care for one another. Um, so you can see that it's very important to children. It actually impacts children um, more than adults, interestingly, um, you see from this. Um, and then again, just a kind of little touch on the research. Again, you can down all of this is in the assembly publication, so you can look at it at your leisure. Um, but having a lot of trash, having a lot of litter is actually associated with uh, really depleted civic trust. So in your public spaces, if you have a lot of litter, it is going to affect the pride that the community has in their community by minus 10%, trusting government by minus 10%, belief that your community members care about each other is again a negative 10%, very significant in research to get these kind of numbers. Um, and then a more interesting, or not more, but a very interesting statistic is the one around trust in police. So trust in police is actually affected by the amount of trash in a neighborhood. Um, and so this allows us to bring in a broader uh, group of people to really be uh, talking to us um, about who, who, who should care about public space, who is affected by public space. And this is obviously showing us that, um, that the police should be part of this conversation. And, and obviously we want to engage them in this conversation. I already mentioned about the maintenance of public space. So if a space is well-maintained, if greenery is well-maintained, it has a very positive impact on trust, a plus 8% increase. But it is, if it is poorly maintained, it's actually at a negative 11. So not only <laughs> do you have poorly maintained green space, but it's actually, it's actually gonna have a broader impact on the overall perception of that by the community. Um, so this is important when you're advocating to municipal governments, to private developers, to whomever is actually controlling those spaces, but it isn't good enough to build the space. You have to program it and you have to have the resources to maintain those spaces as well for them to be uh, positive and have a positive impact on the communities that we're serving. The other thing is not to kind of discount very tiny little changes in our public space that they have very profound impacts on people's perception. Um, and I talked a little bit about whether people feel that they are welcome and whether the space is for them. Um, and this was a part of the experiments that we did. And we basically just photoshopped really tiny differences in these two images and then sent them to two completely different 
uh, groups of people. So we weren't asking people to, to choose one or the other and looking at both. They only saw one or they only saw the other and it was part of a far larger experiment. And our researchers said, you're never gonna see a difference. People aren't even gonna notice the difference, right? No one's gonna, no one's gonna <laughs> see uh, any, uh, respond differently to these two images. And yet we see a 10% difference in how well can people feel with these tiny little, not even very well photoshopped on um, green uh, like bushes and a bench and, and, a, and a light. We even have to draw it to show you. Um, so this we call the kind of the front porch, but really in order to welcome people in the space, these kind of things do make a difference. People do notice and they do react to it. Uh, again, I think it's, it's just important to understand just how perceptive we are and how much we are deriving our um, behavior and our sense of belonging from these very subtle cues in the design of where we live and where we work. Um, so I'm going to just briefly talk about Fitwell. We could spend the rest of the day talking about Fitwell. As I mentioned, it was created by the CDC um, and the arm of the US federal government that manages all the property of the federal government. Um, and then we were selected to operate it um, three years ago. And it's been astonishing to see how quickly it has been adopted by the building professionals and by the owners of real estate um, and, and some municipal governments. Um, behind Fitwell, are 5,600 peer-reviewed research studies. So just so you have an idea of the scale of the research that we're really drawing from. So these are all academic research studies that have been published by academic institutions. These are not small, like little random studies. <laughs> this, is, this is serious research, capital R research. Um, so very important to understand the depth of the public health research that we're pulling from, especially I think in the time right now of a public health crisis, a lot is known already. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, Fitwell looks at all aspects of health. So we look at community health, we look at morbidity, which is really about chronic disease prevention. We're looking at instilled feelings of well-being, which is mental health, uh, social equity for vulnerable populations. We've already touched on the equity aspect, but this is something that needs to be uh, at every conversation. Um, healthy options, food options, uh, safety, a little bit kind of touched on that with the streets, but safety obviously is, is more than just street design, but there's obviously that is very important and then increasing physical activity. That is obviously something we've been doing for a long time. Every strategy in Fitwell impacts at least one of these health impact categories as it is supported by the evidence base. And many of the strategies impact multiple of these health outcomes. So we have building strategies and now we just launched a community uh, certification. So the community certification is exciting. We only launched it a month, just over a month ago. It's really brand new. Um, we took all of the learnings from assembly, we took all of the learnings from public health, and we brought them together to create a new standard under the Fitwell um, standard so that everybody now can benefit from this and start to use it as they either look at their existing public spaces and use it as an assessment tool, use it to benchmark, use it to inform what they should be prioritizing as they move forward, or using it as they actually invest in a space for the first time new construction or um, reuse of existing spaces into new uses. Um, so this has been a big jump forward um, and we're just now rolling it out. So um, we're excited to share this with you and, and globally and really start to hear how people are using uh, this system. It's online, it's super efficient. Um, so it doesn't take a lot of your time to understand it. We're looking at land use, transportation, uh, the design of open spaces, obviously the maintenance and the programming of it, environmental policies, the air quality, the food environment of our public spaces and our neighborhoods at large, community assets, what you have access to within your communities, um, looking at, yes, the buildings as well, that's kind of a subset of this uh, new standard, um, water, restroom access, social cohesion, so that's that trust piece, do people trust each other? Um, do people think that each other are going to do the right thing? Um, these are all influenced by the design and the maintenance of where you live and where you work. Um, and then lastly, emergency preparedness. Uh, do you have a plan in place um, for mitigating the, the greatest impacts of uh, whatever emergency befalls your community? Um, and certainly in New York City, we've had a few in the last few years. Um, so we've had a lot of, a lot of practice in this one. Um, so this is, these are just the kind of overarching areas that Fitwell organizes the literature into and then provides all of those standards for each. You can download the standard for free at fitwell.org and have a look in greater depth at what all of those strategies are. 
I'm just going to kind of close uh, with my real estate hat on a little bit. This is a, this is actually a project in Charlotte, North Car North Carolina, in the south of America, um, that has used Fitwell Community. It was actually a Department of Defense base and one of the Model T Ford factories that they bought and put the two together. Um, and at the moment, um, designing it and adapting it as a community um, resource. Uh, it'll have residential as well as commercial uses and so on. Um, I think what's really interesting about the US and certainly other areas of the world as well, um, and that is that there has been a real sea change in demand over the last 10 years where we don't need to make the argument anymore that where you live and where you work impacts your health outcomes. Um, we now see very strong demand from individuals where that connection has been made and people are really demanding workplaces that promote their health um, and they're also demanding uh, neighborhoods that promote health. And certainly in the US, and we could pull these stats for other countries too, um, people are demanding that they want to live in walkable neighborhoods, they want to live uh, somewhere that they can actually access most amenities uh, in walking distance and not use their cars. Um, and yet in the US, only 2% of real estate listings would be considered highly walkable. So there is a massive gap in what our built environment is providing people and what people are actually wanting. Um, and so that should result in change um, because the, that demand obviously is going to filter through to hopefully the way that development patterns continue to evolve. Um, and certainly that's kind of where we are. We're at the forefront of, of ensuring that that change happens through financial institutions, through developers, cities, et cetera. Um, so as I mentioned, you can download all of this. This was a very quick <laughs> uh, overview of, of the work, but you can download all of the fitwell.org resources um, on the Fitwell website. Um, you can download the resources for free. You can't use the actual system for free. It's a nominal, a nominal charge, but you can actually even download the, the actual strategies of uh, Excel and so on. And then you're very welcome to download all of the different publications that I shared off the Center for Active Design website. Um, and peruse that more at your leisure. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the end of me.